Good morning and welcome to the Ethical Society. Good to see all of you. We're gonna uh, introduce you to something quite different. My name is Kirk Hoyer. I'm the new interim leader here and wanna welcome to the Philadelphia Ethical Society that is also joining us today. Um, when I was reading Felix Adler, I had um, several sections in his thing is about what he thought a platform should look like. And so this is an experimental platform based somewhat on what he had originally envisioned. So uh, we'll see how you like it over the next uh, few months and uh, what we need to make some changes in. Let's begin with something from Jessica Goodfellow who wrote a piece of poetry called The Invention of Fractions. And she said, God created the whole numbers, the firstborn, the seventh seal, 10 commandments etched in stone, the 12 tribes of Israel, 10 we've already lost, 40 days and 40 nights, be ye of one heart and mind, the whole numbers, the counting numbers. It took humankind to need less than this, to invent fractions, percentages, decimals. Only humankind could need the concepts of splintering and dividing, of things lost or broken, of settling for the part instead of the whole. Only humankind could find the whole numbers infinite as they are to be wanting though given a limitless supply, we still had no way to measure what we keep in our many chambered hearts. And I always think of the purpose of platform is to stop the splintering and to find a way to bring us all back together into the whole. Well, like that, I'll introduce Jim Norman, the president of the Ethical Society. Please. Hi. I'd like to welcome you all, and I mean all, including the pe people who are zooming in uh, to our reopening. Um, it's, it looks, it, all right, I can do that. See how the plosives work out without the mask. Uh, <laughs> that's an in-joke for your benefit. <laughs> So welcome everyone. I see we have more chairs than, than people in the building itself, but the, it's good to be back in the building, the newly refurbished built building. Um, and with a little bit of luck over the coming months and years, as, Saturday, as sanity begins to reassert itself, we'll find more and more people in the building and our community will begin to come together again. Welcome. This is a reading from Algernon Black, who for many years was a leader in the New York Society. Some of you may re recall his weekly broadcasts over w WQ uh, WQXR. I know that I grew up with that. Um, and this is what he had to say. This is a call to the living, to those who refuse to make peace with evil, with the suffering and waste of the world. This is a call to the human, not the perfect, to those who know their own prejudices, who have no intention of becoming prisoners of their own limitations. This is a call to those who remember the dreams of their youth, who know what it means to share food and shelter, the care of children and those who are troubled, to reach beyond the barriers of the past, bringing people to communion. This is a call to the never ending spirit of the common person, their essential decency and integrity, their unending capacity to suffer and endure, to face death and destruction and to rise again and build from the ruins of life. This is the greatest call of all, the call to a faith in people. From Algernon Black, thank you. I think it's very important uh, for me as an ethical naturalist and the way I do my ethics is to always think about the ways in which we are also including nature as our partner. We talk so much about our community that we need to remember that we belong to a community of being. And so for each time that we come together, uh, I wanna make sure that we spend at least one or two minutes uh, reminding ourselves of that.
this summer, um, I had the opportunity of hiring some young people from this society to work with me uh, at uh, Sandy Hook, working on uh, the restoration of an area that they hope to eventually open at a park. So if you look right here, you can see Elias uh, Bendian that's right there. And the young man that's down on the ground there uh, is Derek Van Heusen, and they both came to work with us and our crews and our new Climate Resiliency Corps. And to me, uh, I always think of that expression that says that, um, that we didn't inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. And that the most important thing that we can do is prepare that generation to kind of clean up the messes that we've caused. And so this society is gonna be making a commitment to that for this year, hopefully by hiring an environmental leader as well, but also in the ways that we engage all of us. And so I just wanted to take a moment to point out the importance of that and remembering to bring the youth with us during that whole process. So thanks. Thank you, Kurt. Now, I'm gonna introduce someone who really needs no introduction because he's sort of already introduced to us. And that is, that is Kurt Collier, our new interim leader, but I'm going to read a, a couple of par a paragraphs about him to fully introduce him so we know who we're listening to. Uh, Kurt Collier has been an ethical cultural leader for 19 years serving the St. Louis, Riverdale Yonkers and New York societies. He is currently the interim leader of the Bergen Society, a position he's held since March. He yes. formerly was an audiologist in private practice in Texas and has taught speech and hearing sciences, research design and philosophy at Texas Tech University, the, the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, Texas A&M Kingsville, and at Hofstra University in New York. Kurt is currently the National Youth Program Director for Groundwork USA, an organization created by the National Park Service and the EPA, and he works closely with communities and federal agencies engaging the urban youth of color in environmental careers. He currently oversees programs in 20 U.S. cities, engages youth yearly in environmental science, training at eight national parks, including Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and Glacier National Park, and is a frequent guest speaker on engaging diverse audiences for the National Park Service and the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Kurt also collaborates on climate resiliency projects with NASA, and this past year was one of 10 science educators to win a grant from Sigma, Sigma Psi, the National Science Research Society, to design a program to educate diverse audiences about the pandemic. So here is our Renaissance man, Kurt Collier. Yeah, um, thanks for that, I really appreciate it. Uh, I have the wonderful opportunity of getting to work with youth, as you said, across the United States. This is just me building a bridge in Yellowstone Natural Park. What, uh, part of what I do is teach youth construction and to get them involved in the work that, that we need to do going forward. And uh, the great thing is I get to work in some of the most beautiful places in the world with some of the most happy young people to be there because often these are youth who don't have the opportunity to get out there and participate. And one of the things I have to work on and explain to people is about the importance of public lands and why we need them and how important they are to us. And to understand the history of Yellowstone National Park, uh, many of you may not know that Yellowstone was the first national park, not only in the United States, but in the world, uh, founded in 1872. Uh, actually, Ulysses S. Grant never even saw it when he signed it into law, but it just heard so many great things about it. And to understand why we decided in the United States to set aside public lands is a very important thing and what they meant for us. Because for many people in the United States, um, the na nature was the great teacher. It was the great instructor. And we needed these places, people thought, in order to understand the universe. And to give you a little hint about that, when I first moved to Yonkers, New York, um, I got used to seeing this sign as I drove up and down the Hutchinson River Parkway. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen that. Have you seen this sign? Yeah, well, being a curious person, of course, I knew who she was, 
but wanted to figure out more about this. Anne Hutchinson was a remarkable woman. You can see the, the dates that she lived to in. She was part of the early Puritan community. And one of the things that she did is that she would go into town and preach and they would upset everybody. They'd kick her and beat her out of the town. She'd go into another town and preach. They'd get upset and beat her and kick her out of town. Um, she then got arrested. She escaped with some friends. She then moved uh, with her, some of her 15 children uh, to White Plains, New York, where she was unfortunately killed in a Native American attack uh, along with most of her family. But what's interesting about her is that she created what we call the antinomianism controversy in the United States. She said, according to her religious beliefs of the Puritans, some of you are going to go to hell and some of you are going to go to heaven no matter what you do. So then why do I have to listen to you? Because you may be a person who's heading to hell and therefore I don't need to uh, think about or understand anything that you see. But she caused quite a controversy there. She was actually following a long um, uh, a long story and narrative that have started kind of with this guy here, uh, Jacobus Arminius, who basically said that uh, because some people are going to go to hell and some people are going to heaven, there's nothing you can do, that the only way that you could save yourself is through your own personal relationship with a deity. You didn't need priests, you didn't need churches, you didn't need all these things. You just basically had to make this personal commitment. And these two kinds of ideas came to flower in the United States. You know, we often tell the story of the founding of the United States from the arrival of the Puritans, forgetting that Native Americans had been here much longer earlier than that, for sure, but also the English and French by about 55 years had cities in the United States. But the story we tell is often the story of the Puritans, and it's their story that seems to resonate. And part of that is the way that they looked at the world. And for these groups of people, you didn't need other people. You didn't need uh, the priest, and you didn't need these kinds of stuff. The only thing that would work at your own salvation was you and your private deity. And that shaped many of the early ways that people in the United States think to this day and continues to resonate. However, there are other ways and influences that became extremely popular in the United States at that time. One of them, of course, was the large influence of the deists. The deists had started originally in Europe uh, with the age of the Enlightenment, and all of these scientific discoveries were being made. And Newton was publishing his laws of physics and all these powerful ideas were coming out and emerging and were affecting and influencing the world. But the deists had also been influenced by the Calvinists themselves. They also did not believe that God could be present in the world because it was so depraved and so corrupt and a place that he could not hang out in. And therefore, their vision was that the world had been created by a creator God, but then who at the last minute steps out and zaps and creates the world and basically disappears in the universe. The world that was left behind then is something like a roadmap to them. And they thought all these scientific discoveries and all these things that were coming about were actually pointing the way to the mind of God, even if he was no longer present in the world. And these two kind of belief systems, the idea that I don't really need anybody, but I have the world and the world will tell me what I need to know, became uh, extremely powerful ideas in the United States for so many years. If you could think of uh, Henry David Thoreau and his book on Walden Pond, uh, the American transcendentalist took up these two strands of ideas and made it part of the American mantra that one did not need cities or churches. He was a formerly a Unitarian minister, but he left his pulpit and moved into the woods because the only thing one needed to do was to commune with nature, to watch an ant crawling across the ground. And that would tell you everything you needed to know about the nature of the world and about divinity in itself. Of course, Henry David Thoreau was heavily influenced by his mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson, of course, was also uh, one of the famous American transcendentalists. And he had two really important books that I uh, have up here. One of them, of course, is his book on self-reliance, that he was also someone who came from the tradition of the early Calvinists in a way, 
that we did not need to rely on other people, that no one could work out salvation or, good, or goodness or those things except for you, and that you would need to struggle in order to do that, and that nature would be the great teacher, and that what you needed to do is to free yourself in your mind, go into nature, commune, and that would be everything that you needed to know. And so these big, powerful influences are one of the reasons why in 1872 that the first national parks were created in order for uh, us to share important ideas and in order for us to go into these places, these wild and scenic and wonderful places. And those were the original ideas that shaped the foundation of the park uh, at the beginning. However, not everybody believed the same way, of course, as that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You just realized I'm just needed some water. Thank you. One of the, Emerson's other great contributions was something called the self-culture movement uh, in the United States. About basically self-culture halls were intended to do were places where people would come together and free themselves from the shackles of old beliefs and old ideas and find ways to kind of liberate their own selves and arrive at their best selves. That'd be like uh, what we think of self-improvement places, you know, where people would go get rid of the shackles of past ideas that the transcendentalists thought were holding us down and that we'd all find our better selves. And of course, a lot of that had to do with nature. Think of the building of Central Park in New York City and all these places, those were intended for us to have a place to go into the world and feel communing with nature, perhaps to be self-reliant and develop our best kinds of selves. However, there was someone else in the woods at that time, a, a young rabbi uh, wannabe who changed his mind by the name of Felix Adler. Anybody been to the Felix Adler hiking trail in the Adirondacks? We forget that Adler was a great outdoor enthusiast following after uh, Emerson and Thoreau, which are part of his mentors, and he talks about in his own books. In fact, the Felix Adler Trail was named after Felix Adler, and it still exists in the Adirondack Mountains. But Adler, of course, was heavily influenced by these thinkers and ideas, and he also thought deeply about that. But he came to a radically different conclusion than they did something that other people were not talking about, and certainly wasn't in the current theme of the day. Uh, Adler, of course, thought that instead of a self-culture where you just needed to work out your own destiny, your own salvation, that somehow we needed each other, that it was in the give and take of the struggle of social justice, of learning, of relationships, of figuring out what humans needed from each other was more important uh, than the self-culture halls. The, the, just sitting alone in your closet, Adler said, would never be enough to work out the destiny from the universe about what we need. And in fact, instead of going alone into nature, what we needed to do is to reach back around, look at each other's faces and engage each other in the act of eliciting the best. And in that struggle, somehow something bigger and broader would unfold from that. He then, of course, founded the Society for Ethical Culture. And the Society for Ethical Culture was intended to be that, not a self-culture, but a way of working together with others, of community struggle, of activism, of giving together. You know, Adler and Emerson, uh, Charles Darwin, Mary Shelley and her Frankenstein, Charles Lyell, and many others were actually influenced by this person here that most people have forgotten about. Does anybody know who this is? This was at one time the most famous person in the world. In fact, at one time, the United States had decided to name the state of Nevada, actually originally at him. And we didn't want to call it the Rockies. Its original name was going to become the, Andy, the Humboldt Andes. This is Alexander von Humboldt, who at one time was the most famous scientist in the world. It's interesting, if you look at Darwin, who he, Darwin attributes as his most famous influence, it was Alexander von Humboldt. If you look at Samuel Coolidge, the, the painters, if you look at so, uh, Simone Bolivar, the revolutionary down in South America, they all pointed to one person, Thomas Jefferson, to this guy right here, who was the great naturalist of his day. 
In fact, there are more place names named after Humboldt in the United States than any other person, including George Washington in the United States. He was that famous and most people have forgotten who he was at, at, um, anymore. But he had actually formulated this idea that actually all things in nature are connected to one another. And that what you do to one part of nature would heavily influence what happened to other parts of nature as well. Um, he's the idea, the guy who came and said in 1794 that what we're doing to the planet was causing environmental damage. And unless humans change their ways, it was going to lead to the, ever, the irreparable damage of our client, the loss of soils, the loss of our atmosphere, all of these things that he predicted. In fact, he thought that deforestation, weird agricultural practices, and somehow the steam engine would contribute to the downplay of our United States in 1804. He was the most respected scientist of his day, and he was a very, very uh, broad thinker. And what Alexander von Humboldt said is the fact that all things are connected into nature. In fact, that there is a need for the uh, things to be uh, unity and I mean, uh, have their own individual unique ideas, but that together they made it everything. And if to pull at one thing or destroy one thing affected the other. We forget that Felix Adler was a heavily reader of Alexander von Humboldt as well, but doesn't mention him in an ethical philosophy of life. He mentions him in other places, but not in there. We also know that, Alex, uh, that Felix Adler, the founder of ethical culture, attended Humboldt University in Berlin. It certainly would have known of the great scholar, one of the most uh, well-known people in the world who had just passed away, and of the thinking from that. And if you look at Felix Adler's ideas, he takes one other step, and he says that there's an organicity to life, that each of us are unique and different and have our own insights and our unique ways to be a being, but that collectively we create something that's very important. And the damage, one part of it is to cause uh, irreparable damage in the other. And that his belief, Adler's belief about this, of course, resonates with Alexander von Humboldt and the people of his day. The ethics that he created then was not one just of self-culture. We have an ethics of collectivism. We are ethicus or homo ethicus. We are the ethical person living in communities. And we were to be a society for an ethical culture not a society that was focusing on making any individual a better person, but on a place that was thinking of the collective whole and how that brought out our best or brought out our worst. And that was the work that he thought that we should each engage into. And it was what makes our message so difficult for others to understand, who are so focused maybe on self-improvement or trying to figure out their own ethical path without thinking of the ways that we're connected together. So what I hope to do and to embark with you in the next several months is on a journey of what this collective ethics looks like to talk about what our society should be and how we should treat each other. But I'm gonna leave that for another day. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, for that, that romp through the woods and through <laughs> the antecedents of what we now call ethical culture. At this point, I'd like to depart from the what. Let me take this off. Yeah. At this point, I'd like to depart from the way we are used to doing things. Instead, instead of questions and comments, I'd like to invite people uh, to offer uh, ref reflections on what Kurt just said and how it resonates with them, with you, in your lives. And did it provoke any thoughts in you about how you fit in to the whole. So if you can think about that for a few seconds, um, and then uh, perhaps uh, uh, offer your own contributions, that would be good. Lisa. Thanks, thanks, Jim, I think that's a great idea. And I wouldn't, Kurt, when you were talking about nature and the interrelationship, what came to my mind was what we've all just been through this past year and a half and still with COVID. And um, what it made me think about is how much nature played a role in our lives during this last year and a half. Um, I, I feel like people have been more in touch with 
the nature around them through the flowers they were seeing, the birds. Um, one of the things that I noticed uh, during this whole year and a half is I was seeing birds that I never saw before on my feeder and in my yard. And uh, I don't know if I just didn't notice before or that nature was just more abundant because everything else kind of stopped. And just, you know, Ron with his photography, with his flowers, you know, people say, who is this man? <laughs> you know, he's never really paid attention to so much to flowers, but because all we were doing was hiking and walking, we became more attuned to nature. So I felt that your talk was just especially relevant now with what we've just been through. So thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else? For myself, I go. Only Humboldt I ever heard of was the Humboldt current, which I assume has to do with, with Humboldt. I'll, I'll, I'll be looking up more about von Humboldt. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you. There's Humboldt's gift novel by Saul Bellow. Um, so the thing that I've noticed the most during COVID is that I have appreciated more my closest friends and how very important they are to me. And I value my acquaintances, of course, um, but I've, I've uh, deepened my love for my closest friends. And that's the thing that's, I don't know if others have experienced that same thing, but that's been my realization. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And anyone else have a, a, a reflection? A, a a resonation. Yeah, I, I have a reflection. Oh, yes. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you guys. Yeah, should I say, should I uh, give my reflection? Yes, please do. Oh, okay. So, uh, like, I'm a philosopher, and it's funny because over the years, I've come to the conclusion that what most people think are objects are really relationships, and that. I think I, I was really, I didn't know that much about Humboldt and I knew a little bit about Humboldt, but it was very interesting to me to hear that quote that Kurt referenced because it was very much in keeping with my philosophy, except I guess we're like 200 years that have been advanced and I have a more radical view, which is that even the, the objects, it's like the theory of internal relations that Kurt might be aware of that the relations create the terms rather than the terms creating the relationship. I think ultimately there's only one term and that it's in self-relationship and that everything that we experience is a form of relationship and that all the objects that we experience are functions of relationship. And so the, the relations are more, in some sense, at least in the phenomenal world, the relations are more fundamental than the objects, but there has to be something that grounds relations. So I do believe in um, um, the transcendent being because there has to be something that transcends the relations, but it has to always be in self-relationship. So I thought it was amazing that Humboldt so far advanced in his thinking like that it was very profound it's almost more of a metaphysicist than a, than a scientist in some ways because he gets underneath the phenomena and understands that this this idea that these relations are really the most important thing even though he still thought they were relations between objects whereas i think that the objects are a function of the relationships and so it's maybe more of an a buddhist concept too, but yeah, thanks a lot for that. Uh, um, like that um, presentation, very good. And thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Your resonant resonance. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, Ron. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Jim. <laughs> Two things that Kurt uh, has talked is reminding me about. One is past year uh, in relation to community how much I personally missed this community. Being on Zoom is one thing, but being here in person and seeing your faces and feeling your touch, sometimes your hugs, uh, how important that was to me. And I think Lisa feels the same way as well, uh, because we only make ourselves better by making other, other people better as well and being in a, in a community. The second thing is that the social action nature of this of this group is so important to me. Uh, this year, I saw that once again, I got involved helping to create this group called One Town, One Vote, 
where we're trying to move the municipal elections from May to November to get more people involved in our democracy here in town. And I started with a very small group. And as the weeks went by, the group grew larger and larger and larger and larger. We ultimately got more than 60 volunteers to go around with petitions to try to put this question on the ballot. And I met so many more people who are interested in the, uh, the wealth, uh, the, um, the worth and dignity of this community and getting people more involved with democracy. And it's, I must tell you, it's thrilling to see this kind of uh, activity going on and people, so many people working together towards a common goal to try to make things a little better. So the idea of community is what uh, uh, is inspiring me at this point, not only here, but in, in my own, in my town as well. Thank you, Ron. Is there anyone else? Yes, we have uh, Pam Berglund on Zoom. Pam, welcome. Um, this year, because of COVID, our community has helped me see the beauty in nature. And I saw the beauty in nature because I saw the wonderful photos, the beautiful photos that were sent by Susan and, and David when they went on their trips. And Margot Moss, who took us through beauty of the flowers and the, and the green grass. And one thing you can't take away, the pandemic can maybe take away lives, can you know destroy families, but the pandemic will never be able to destroy nature. And we need to live with nature and continue living with nature and find all its beauty in the world. And we have a lot of beauty right here in the United States and maybe even in New Jersey where we need to look for more beautiful places to look at and watch. So yes, we've been through a rough year. Will it end soon? Probably not. But like I said, you can take some things away, but you can't take things that are of nature away. And that's what we need to live for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. We also have Patty Richards. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I'm actually in the car. Oh, okay, yeah. Great. Um, um, hi, Patty. So Welcome. Hey, this thought is um, bringing to mind a documentary I just saw about the first all-black rowing team um, at a high school in the late 90s in Chicago. Um, at this time in Chicago, one out of every three um, black men before the age of 18 would be in jail or murdered. Um, so this first team, um, you know, with guys from different gangs were taken out into the water for the first time getting far out of the city. And the moment that they all described of the peace and the tranquility, you know, and the restorativeness that nature offers in a moment, you know, it has the ability to change people's lives. Um, but it just, it also reminds me that it can be an elitist thing to have access to nature. Um, during COVID, you know, I was able to drive out and meet friends for social distance walk, but um, it is one of those things that needs to be accessible to all. It really improves the quality of life. And in this case, you know, actually saved some people's lives. Thank you, Patty. And now Janet Glass. Um, I think our whole society resonated with, uh, with what Kurt had to say because we've been environmental activists to some extent for the past few years. Um, in 2017, we staged a huge rally. There were 300 people on the steps of the Hackensack Courthouse uh, was covered by the, the newspapers and the TV shows. And that was uh, largely due to our efforts. So I think we resonate very much with the environmental message uh, we also joined something called Green Faith, and Green Faith is congregations that are involved with the environment, and we're a member, um, a, a, a leading member, actually, and there were eight congregations, uh, a Muslim, Evangelical, Jewish, uh, Humanist, Episcopalian, all, all different stripes, and we all gathered around 
the, the environment as our, uh, our common cause. And that's still ongoing. I had a meeting with Green Faith just two nights ago. Um, so I think we all resonate very, very strongly with the message of environmentalism. Thank you, Janet. Is there a Elaine, Elaine and Dan? Elaine and Dan, welcome. Hi, this is Dan. And just sort of a footnote to what Kurt was saying about Alexander von Humboldt. Um, he also, and this is something that uh, we you know, can learn from, and I don't know how much it influenced early ethical, but um, he believed, and this was a, still a radical idea in the late 18th and 19th century, he believed that Black people were fully equal to white people. Um, he was not merely anti-slavery because he thought slavery was wrong and immoral, but he went beyond most white abolitionists who were who waffled on whether Black people were fully equal. Um, and he said, yeah, Black people are absolutely fully equal to white people. Um, uh, a, a radical idea then among whites, um, not among Blacks, uh, of course, um, but uh, another way in which um, we can and should uh, look back to his, uh, uh, his influence and um, still not really fully appreciated by all too many people in this country. Okay, Dan, thank you very much for that reflection. And at, at this point, I'm going we do, to- We do have one more, Jim, if you uh, have time. Okay. Yeah, one, one more. Go one, ahead. one more. Sure. Who who will this be? Eric Sandhusen. Oh, Eric. Hi. Welcome. Great to see everybody. I'm uh, driving through the beautiful Catskills. I'm actually pulled off, so I can do this. But uh, coming back through the Catskills, and the first blush of fall is just on the leaves. So something more beauty of nature to look forward to. But uh, the reflection that uh, that came to me from your uh, from your talk, Kurt was, um, you know, I think that uh, the idea of improving oneself uh, and improving the world, are, they really work in unison and it shouldn't be either or. And I think insofar as it is either or, uh, we lose out on something important. And I know oftentimes the social justice nowadays, it seems a lot like scolding or scorning. Uh, there's a lot of snark in the conversation on all sides. Um, and I hope that, you know, we can find a way to move forward that, that gets us away from that and uplifts ourselves and our community and improves the world by example to some degree. I guess maybe that's what I'm hoping to get to. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you all for your resonations. I deeply appreciate that. That was Adler's original vision is that after ethicals uh, platforms that we'd have an opportunity to deepen the conversation and to resonate and to share things. So thank you for that experiment. Um, I'd like to add on to a little bit something else at our Sam, let's share my screen one more time. Not far from us in uh, Nyack uh, is a museum and a house dedicated to uh, a painter that probably many of you are familiar with, which is Edward Hopper. Edward Hopper's, uh, have anyone here been to the house museum? Right. Hopper's work, of course, is this uh, pretty amazing work. Most people know his more famous painting about Nighthawks. Um, he was raised in a very strict Baptist community, also raised with the idea of that you needed to work at your own destiny. And it had a profound impact on him and, and on his artwork for the rest of his life, choosing subdued colors and also showing a lot of things and where people were alone or where who were facing a sense of alienation from themselves or from their work or from other things. And that loneliness and an alienation is something that Edward Hopper tried to capture in his own paintings to talk about the things that separate us one from another. And that was what for Felix Adler was the thinking about how our culture worked and how our culture uh, could create places that we could come together and find common ground and work together. Or if it was places that left us more alienated and more isolated. Um, I thinking of all the recent things that have happened in politics and about the pandemic 
and how people even refuse to wear a mask because they think it's somehow impringing on their personal freedom goes back to that or original ideas in the colony that I am in charge of my own destiny and to, to hell with the rest of you, it doesn't really matter. And these are the things, the currents that run deep in American society and the things that we have to bring back together and fix and reconnect on one to another again, because eventually what's going to happen is we're going to replay the same old mistakes if we don't have to bridge that. And that was what a society for ethical culture was intended to do, was to think about the ways in which we are alienated from one another and to think about a ways in which we can bring people back. You know, Franklin Roosevelt said, if civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships. And he was reflecting on the war years and all the things that have happened to us. And that he called for us to think about a ways, the science of relationships, to somehow bring it together, to find a way, as he says, to live together in the same world and in peace. And I leave you with the words of one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, Mae West, who says, you only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. Have a great day. Thank you. To learn more about us, visit our website, ethicalfocus.org, or email us at admin at ethicalfocus.org and we'll get back to you. To make a donation, go to ethicalfocus.org slash donate. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can watch many of our past programs on our YouTube channel.